So for the benefit of the audience, whoever may someday watch this video, we're here primarily to explore the circumstances surrounding Operation Spanner and your involvement within that. So before we get into any of the specifics around that, would you give us a general idea about Operation Spanner? Well, it was a few days after the big British storm where famously the weatherman said, I can assure Mrs. So-and-so there is not going to be any storm tonight. And then it was a huge storm. That was in like November 77. And about a week or so after that, um, there was a, you wouldn't call it a knock, more like a battering at the door at around 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, we were both still in bed, went down to see what it was. It was policemen, um, seven or eight of them. The first thing I knew about it was this strange bloody policeman turned up in my bedroom telling me to get out of bed and so on. So, I mean, I didn't actually realise initially who the hell it was. You just thought, my God, there's someone in the house. You know? But it was made fairly clear they were police um, and I had to come down immediately and talk to them. Um, and uh, that, there was, I remember one phase, there was something like, um, right, do you want to get dressed? I said, no, I didn't invite you in here, I'll get dressed when I want to. And um, so I didn't, I stayed in my dressing gown. Uh, I didn't know what they were going to do. I mean, s almost straight away they said, oh, um, I expect you know what we're here for. And I said I didn't, because in detail, I didn't really know. I knew there'd been some raids going on, I thought they were vaguely SME. But still I had no real idea that anything I'd been doing would be of interest to the police. Um, so we got down here and they started, it was a sort of interval uh, interview, it wasn't under caution, I wasn't cautioned or anything. Um, there were, as I say, seven of them, three of them were in charge pretty much. Um, Inspector Baker was the sort of main man that came and then we had I can't remember what their actual police titles were at the time, but inspectors, detective inspectors or detective constables. Um, Robert Lang, was it Robert Langley, I think, and um, something Yayo, um, and they played um, sort of you know soft cop, cop, tough cop sort of things. So anyway, Baker started. Um, explain what they were here for. We're here in connection with obscene material and assaults on people and all this sort of... And even then it didn't click. <laughs> took a wow. bit of time to click wow. what they were talking about. And then I realised, of course, they're talking about the SME side of my life. Um, so that was definitely a bit of a shock. They were here for over two hours. They said effectively that, um, you know, if I wasn't going to answer their questions, they'll just take me down to the police station and question me there. Question me there. Um, they, the three main ones were to do really with the questioning side of life. The other four were going on a search of the house because they had their search warrant looking for obscene oh. materials, this, that and the other. So they were rummaging through all the drawers and wardrobes and anything else and I had a look in the loft. Um, or attic, whichever you prefer, or garrick, <laughs> okay. uh, and out in the garage and the workshop and the summer house, anywhere they thought I might have had a dungeon or or whatever, and um, which I didn't. Too much effort, honest. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so while they were rummaging around, the three main ones were asking me all sorts of questions, and. When I'm under pressure, um, my mind goes a complete fog. That sort of pressure. I mean, this is authority figures you realise yes. are now turned up into my life, yes. of which I've always had a sort of certain dread. Um, not based on any real event, to be honest, because I never had been in trouble with the police before. But just the thought of authority, like you know, the religious figures and the police and courts, always sort of terrified me. And um, so he started on at me. They started going through, they wanted to know where my tapes were and who my contacts were. They picked up 
address books and so on that they found out there. Uh, they rummaged through the doors and took all the um, household financial and other documents away that they could find. Um, we found out later that not only did they think we were doing um, snuff movie, this when I say us, I mean us as a group of people yes. charged. Yes. But not only were we doing things like snuff movies, but we're obviously doing it all for profit. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and uh, so they took all the financial stuff away. The only thing is, plod being plod, they took all the financial stuff away and none of mine. <laughs> so they couldn't even get that right, you know. And then at one point, um, they found some children's games in one of the drawers which was like snakes and ladders and Ludo and these sort of and draft sets and things and one of them said and I maybe they say these things to offend and see how you react I don't know but they said oh do you get children here to torture them you know and that sort of really got to me I said no I don't I said I said my mother who's in her 80s she likes to play board games and things like that when she comes over so we keep them to play with her when she comes. So I sort of dropped that bit of it and then I, at one stage I told them, I said, oh I was, um, what do you do? They wanted a brief history. They said, we don't want your life story. Anyway, it's like in a brief history. And um, then they talked about work and where I previously worked. Um, and then they said, Oh, I see you had a connection here with the Boys Brigade. They're putting two and two together already and making five, like they tend to. And I said, I've never been involved in anything untoward whatsoever within the Boys Brigade. I said, not only that, I didn't volunteer to join. Someone at work said, if you've got nothing to do this summer, would you like to come and help out with the camp? Well, as I said previously, I was relatively lonely. This was before I met gay people, so I hadn't got anything so I went out and stayed with them for a few years but that um, gave up for two reasons one is um, I met my partner and um, then I hadn't got any time for the uh, boys brigade because I was too busy yeah. and the other thing was which we got round they said oh well would you like to join the staff if you like I said well, what was that involved well you have to do this swear allegiance to God and so on I said no I can't do that mm -hmm. I said, I'm sorry. They said, oh, it doesn't matter, just say it. I said, well, it matters to me, I said, if I say it, um, I have to mean it. And I said, and I, I don't mean it, so I can't say it, so I didn't join. <laughs> so I left. Anyway, that was that. And then they done the financial stuff, and they wanted to know where the tapes were. And at that time, the tapes were all in the front of the room in, um, like, drawers that I'd made up. that had about 15, 16 tapes per drawer, because I had over 300 odd okay. tapes. Um, and then they started asking about names and addresses of people and I couldn't remember virtually anybody's name at that moment but they eventually sort of wheedled out of me the names that they obviously had in advance and wished to know a bit about. Um, so that was it and oh and they came from upstairs with stuff and one of the things they came from upstairs was a, a toy billiard cue that I'd had uh -huh. since I was about 11 or 12. Uh -huh. Oh. One of them, what do you use this for, beating people? I said, no, I use it as a remote control for the telly in the bedroom because it had a little, I put a little sort of cup on the end and you could work with little knobs on the telly with it without getting out of bed. So I said, that's what that's for. And then my mate said, we told you that as well already. He told him that already. So reluctantly, this baker chap said, well, you better give it back to him. You know, because they were looking for anything that they considered like fetish wear. Because they took fetish wear off lots of other people. They call it fetish wear. We call it leather gear. So yeah. <laughs> um, they took all that sort of stuff off. Um, and then after two and a half, two, two and a half hours or so, they left. Oh, one of them said, do you mind, or oh, Baker, I think, do you mind if I'm, I need to make a phone call? Do you mind if I make a phone call? I said, only if you give us some money for it. I said, I'm not going to pay for your phone calls. <laughs> you come here uninvited. Um, so reluctantly hand over 20p, you could see that annoyed you. But, um, and then we were in a state of shell shock really, because this just wasn't being expected, this was a Monday morning. Fortuitously I'd actually got the day off work, because I'd already booked it as a day's holiday, 
and that was because I'd been off down the West Country for a weekend SM session uh, <laughs> with um, a couple of the other defendants, it turned out. Um, and very, and that, that's the fortunate bit, so I didn't have to go to work that day. And then the unfortunate bit was the video equipment and everything was all sitting out in the hall, hallway, so they took that all away. The they took all the video equipment and stuff, which I'd brought originally to um, film my parents who were ageing um, and our holidays and things like this, you know, so that the day of the raid. It's odd because although we'd been warned that raids were going on, it didn't actually occur to me that they'd come here. <laughs> That's naivety, I think. Um, it's not going to happen to me syndrome, a lot of people have. Yeah. Um, and as I said, we left shell-shocked and we didn't know quite what to do then. We drove, drove us out into the countryside somewhere and we just sat in the car in the countryside, talking. Of all the people that must have been on these tapes that they mm. found, yes. how were you identified? <laughs> well, first, of course, they are able to question everybody. I mean, we're not talking about, it's not like a telly where you have a 10 minute question session and everybody fesses up in a few minutes. This, the um, the uh, interrogations of there were over 300 people questioned about Spanner. Wow. Um, and those investigations and um, question sessions with the police, um, they obviously joined up lots of dots and so on. So I think they'd worked out pretty much from people's statements and so on who it was was where at okay. what time. So that wasn't too difficult. But when it actually got to court, the first court, this is just a little brief one, it's only a magistrate court, the magistrate said, how did you know it was Jagod doing the filming? And I think it was Langley said, I recognised his voice on the tape and I thought, yeah, of course you did, because <laughs> I didn't think it was that. It wasn't any different really to hardly anybody else's. So um, that's more or less how that happened. Um, so that's how I got identified. I hadn't told him anything. I said no comment throughout because I didn't. I knew that I didn't have to say a thing and I wasn't going to. I mean, I was a bit silly a couple of occasions. Um, I could have said something that would have been to my advantage, but I thought, well, start on the answering one question, you end up answering loads. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I didn't say anything. I mean, solicitor advice, say nothing, so that's what I said. Yeah. What do you know about the other people who were raided? A anything at all? Well, at the time of the raid, I didn't know who had been raided, obviously, because they don't tell you who else they've um, they've raided, you only find that out in retrospect once oh, you okay. get charge sheets and so on board. Um, the people that I knew um, were a friend of a friend of a friend sort of thing, a sort of string of people, the same I described earlier for how you met people originally in clubs and pubs and things. Sure. It's just people you get to know, so I got to know quite a few people. Um, and some of them, it turned out, were involved. Um, some of them, I mean, when we've actually got to the court, the main court, the um, uh, Central Criminal Justice Court, was appropriately named and uh, known colloquially as the Old Bailey. Okay. Um, I have to say, I'd never seen half the people there <laughs> before. So um, they made a lot of the connections between us all, whereas actually, they're pretty tenuous, a lot of them. So, in terms of no, I wouldn't say any of them were really what you'd call close friends at all. They were all acquaintances. They were sex party gay acquaintances, essentially. Sure. Sure. Yeah, in this immoral world that us gays live, you know, where you can bump off with people you've only just met. <laughs> so, um, very naughty because, again, as I mentioned previously, heterosexuals just don't do it like that, you know, right. they need to wine and dine them. Whereas we, you know, sort of, hello, how do you do? Ooh! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, so I didn't really know anybody. I, well, some of them were acquaintances. I actually got to know a lot of them a lot better during and after the case. 
because that's when we spend more time together, obviously. The raid upon your home yes. was a monstrous violation of your privacy, your person. Yeah. The police took, I think you said, your video camera, personal yeah. photos, mementos, yeah. videotapes. They were all confiscated, and you yes. had to go to court to recover your things. Well, even now, I never got them all back. <clears throat> but some of the tapes they took, uh, they took all the tapes. And as I said before, the vast majority were nothing to do with or could be to do with the case. A lot of them were stuff filmed off television programs, uh. Uh, home movies on holidays and things, uh, day trips out. There was I treated to a special um, away day, steam day on one of his favourite locos. They took that one as well. That's one of the ones I applied to have back. And the reason for that was my camera at the time, which was an Olympus, one of the early um, full-size VHS, it was a twin pack thing where you had the power pack oh, down oh, at your oh, side oh, and the oh. camera up here. And that was a jolly good system for its day. Um, they took that, that's been filmed on that. And that allowed you to put text into the picture. Oh, okay. Got a way of a sort of little menu you could. So I put some text in on the railway trip. But similarly, another tape they found, it said naked youths in the same text. And that was me doing compilations of, like, um, well, I suppose you call them naked youths, really, <laughs> from um, various videos that I'd got um, and shots in books and things. Just sort of soft porn, pin-up type stuff, you know, and that just said make it use. Um, so that was that. That did cause an embarrassing story, but I won't bother you with that at the moment. Ah. Suffice it to say, I wasn't pleased. Anyway, um, they took all those. Um, and it, the reason we had to get them back, they wouldn't let us have anything directly connected with the prosecution which, as I said, is very little, because it's evidence yeah. that could be used in court against you. But they still were terribly reluctant to give the rest back. They gave a whole swage of stuff back, all the home general um, off the telly and stuff, but they didn't give, for instance, this home movie of the railway trip oh. and one or two similar ones. They wouldn't give them back. And so I applied to the court um, as did Colin. I mean, I must bring in Colin and um, Colin Lasky and Tony Brown here as well. Colin Lasky also had his video cameras and things um, confiscated. He had two video cameras. So he got them both back because they didn't know which one was doing the filming, so they couldn't confiscate either. Okay. Whereas poor old Muggins here only had one, so they knew that must have been the one, so they kept that. It's pissed me off a bit, um, but even that, even though the court had said they should be returned, they weren't, and nor were Collins um, things returned. So we applied through a magistrate's court to get them returned on the basis that the police are not above the law, and if the courts say return property, that's what they should do. Yeah. Um, and it's a fairly well-known tactic by all accounts. They assume that people that have been sort of um, raided and similar things aren't going to have the nous to do it. They'll just roll over and mm -hmm. accept whatever the police say and do to them, mm -hmm. almost. And even at that early stage, I thought, no, sod this. This was one of our favourite days out. You know, it was a present, a treat for him and so on. I'm not going to let them keep that. Was obviously, at those times, it was the only copy we had. Um, and even I had some stuff of my parents, and I had, that was part of the same thing. We also had a couple of personal photograph albums that we'd done. <coughs> this was the day when Polaroids had just started life. What a release that was. Uh, yeah. And um, so we had a, a little album of Polaroids that we'd done over the years, and I had to get them back through the court as well. Um, the only other thing I didn't, the thing I never got back, um, was I had a friend of mine, I mentioned CHE at the beginning, and I mm. went to Hatfield for a group there. The guy in charge of that, where I stayed for two nights, um, 
he took some pictures of me uh, when I was, well, almost the first week I'd met. And uh, I didn't get them back, which is a shame, because I had them taken with the view that when I'm the age I am now, I'd be able to look back on a young me and oh. <laughs> think, oh, look at that long haired, because it used to be down here oh. somewhere at one time, you know, okay. hippie style, shoulder length, <laughs> horny youth sort of thing. But uh, anyway, there you go. What possible use did they have for photographs of, of They don't a have any use, it's just bloody mindedness. Yeah. Their whole attitude is bloody mindedness, sort of, you know, we're in charge of this, we'll say what you can and can't do, and so on. And that was their attitude more or less throughout, yeah. um, in all dealings with them. Yeah. Well, I, when we were preparing for this, you told me that <coughs> the raid upon your home and your mm. person and your mm. things yeah really affected both your physical and your psychological health and it also yeah. affected your professional work. Yeah. Um, tell us about that. Well, on the day of the raid, um, as I said, we disappeared off, had driven me out to the country, so we just sat in the car and talked. And initially, understandably so, he was very angry that the raid had happened. He was angry with me for having brought it upon him and you know, he knew that this would be somewhat chaotic from here on. Um, and he also knew that mentally he wasn't sure whether I would survive because I've never been very strong, either physically, I know it belies looks, but <laughs> either physically or uh, mentally. So he, but he was very angry with me initially. But that very soon wore off and in a quick time he was very angry with them yeah. and everything around them. Um, and the way they were dealing with things. And then I went into work the following day and one of the guys said, you look really ill. I said, yeah, I'm not great. Um, as I, I had had merit rises and so on prior to this and was, as I said, doing well at work and was well thought of, I never got another merit rise. Subsequently, I also got, um, if you like, shifted sideways. That's always a bad um, yeah. sign in any big organisation. Um, the police never said that they'd visited work, but they must have. Oh. I had security clearance and they would have found that out quite quickly, so I don't doubt for a second that they'd been to work, <coughs> possibly through me work stuff, you know, me filing cabinets and desk and stuff. Because um, I understand from some of the other people in the case that they'd had their workplaces visited. Okay. Um, and one of the peripheral guys, uh, he was a teacher in a nearby um, private prep school. Private in this country is public in oh, the US. Okay. Fee, fee paying. He was a teacher okay. there. Royal County's a bloody good teacher. Um, and they and the police um, he told the teacher told his superiors in the school and they said, no, your private life, they took all his leather gear and stuff, your private life is private, it's nothing really to do with us. So he didn't get sacked. But the police then decided, having heard that he hadn't got sacked, to contact the governors. So they told the governors of the school about it, and they sacked him. So, you know, I mean, that's, no, that's nothing to do with fairness and justice, that's to do with vindictiveness and yeah. so on. Um, so this started having a bad effect. My work performance obviously declined. There was no time scale given. You had no idea whether they were going to turn up again the following day, week, month. Oh, In gosh. the event, it took them the best part of two years yeah. to um, summons me for another interview. Oh no, I tell you what, we did have an interview down um, New Scotland Yard. Um, but the first one had to be abandoned because I more or less fell apart in the interview. And I can remember one of them saying, I don't know how this bloke keeps a job. Wow. Well, amazingly enough, in my job, you very rarely get interrogated yeah. in, that very, in that style of, that the police use. I mean, there, were no, there was no violence involved or anything, but it was obviously designed to wear you out and wear you down. Yeah. So uh, they abandoned the first interview, and the second one was done with a tape recording available, you know, like they use these tape machines. And actually that made me feel happier 
because I knew that they couldn't then bugger about with what they said they'd said. So, because I didn't trust them quite quickly. Right. And even my solicitor, when we took a, um, a brief fresh air break, I noticed he didn't leave his um, briefcase or anything in the interview room. He brought it with him. Yeah. And so I commented on it and he said, no, I never leave anything like that. And you don't know what they're going to do. Um, so it had a detrimental effect, shall we say. Work performance went down. I had to keep going because I still had meetings to attend and projects to run and all the rest of it. But I did get shuffled sideways. I mean, it was a bit demeaning. Initially, I moved from the office I had into a smaller office slightly further away and then another smaller office even further. And eventually, I was put back in amongst the guys in general, which is a more open plan place. So that's all pretty horrible, especially when you enjoyed your job and you were good at it. Yeah. Um, and of course, once we got to the being charged, um, well, that's another story a bit later. I think. So they, they, they moved you from a larger office they basically shuffled you sideways into another office. Yeah. This obviously affected your work performance. Oh, yes. Well, um, what was the point of really making a big effort when um, you knew it was almost certainly going to turn out badly? Um, and I wouldn't say it was a relief at the end of ten years, uh, two years when they finally um, decided to bring charges, but um, you can't work under that sort of mental strain for ages wondering what's happening. Yeah. We've got very little information via um, sort of gay world. We, the police themselves, they were busy putting information into the gay world um, saying we were looking for a spiral staircase and we have reason to believe that um, people may have been murdered. So what they were doing, they were fishing. They were putting a sort of um, I'm trying to think what the phrase for it is now. Um, they were trying to basically to sort of put in things that were shocking oh. to try and bring out anybody who was a bit peripheral to, to say, oh yes, we remember this or so and so happened. Um, and uh, it turned out one of my videos was done in the place of the spiral staircase, which I'm sure was what they were trying to get out. They were trying Got to it. get some more dirt on anybody that might have been involved in that. But nothing really shocking under that um, venue, that was really just some bondages and beatings and things like this. Um, I did crack up under the strain um, and went down to see a psychiatrist, well I went to see the doctor first and he prescribed antidepressants and so on. Um, <coughs> and then it, I was at a sort of stable level then. Up until they brought charges, so that sort of covers the two years with everything going pretty badly. Very, there was a great strain on our relationship. Um, he has said he would never have left, but it, it's not going to be nice living with someone under that sort of um, stress. Yeah. And, and also being associated because he's a very private person. Um, and just the few things that have been, there's been very little written in the press originally because of course they had no names because yeah. they don't release names until you're charged. Okay. So worse was yet to come as they say. <laughs>